Because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. Words taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Woodstock Music Festival was held in Bethel, New York, near the Catskill Mountains from August 15th to August 17th in the year 1969. This event for hippies and music lovers was held at Max Yasger's 600-acre farm and drew some half a million spectators. Tickets for the Woodstock event could be purchased beforehand or at the gate. But wouldn't you know, more than 60% of the participants just crashed the gates for a weekend of freedom, free love, freedom from authority, a life of liberty complete with illicit drugs, a period of licentiousness and lawlessness, if only for a short time. Of course, the ideals of this countercultural movement had some serious consequences, including there being no sanitation, little or no food supplies, and a totally inadequate medical and first aid facility. The New York County in which the event was held eventually declared a state of emergency, and the governor of the state of New York seriously considered calling in the National Guard. And then there was the rain and the mud mixed in as well. Altogether, some 32 musical bands and solo artists performed, including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, The Grateful Dead, and Creedence Clearwater Revival. The lead singer of that last group mentioned, namely John Fogarty, described his band's performance in the following way, quote, We were ready to rock out at 3 a.m. Interesting. 3 a.m. But there were half a million people asleep. These people were out cold. It was sort of like a painting of a scene from Dante. Just bodies from hell, all intertwined and asleep, covered with mud, unquote. But despite all the drawbacks, the mud, the absence of food and sanitation, and yes, the deaths, some people today still look upon Woodstock as a wonderful event, an event in which the people were free to do whatever they wanted to do, if only for a weekend. Although most people look at Woodstock in the hippie era with a certain sense of humor, the mindset present during that time period exposed a fundamental problem present within our nation from the very beginning, from its very foundation. You see, the constitution of our nation, our founding document, our instrument of liberty, was written by a non-Christian, by a deist named James Madison, at a constitutional convention attended by men who were largely infected with the errors of Freemasonry and the Enlightenment, which denied all divine revelation, especially the gospel of Jesus Christ. More than a few writers suggest that the Constitution was somehow divinely inspired, yet there is no mention, no mention of the divinity within the entire text of the document. One member of that convention in Philadelphia was greatly grieved and protested that there was no mention of God or the Christian religion in the Constitution. The objection was answered by Alexander Hamilton with the phrase, I declare, we forgot it. Furthermore, the historical record of this event in the city of brotherly love mentions the rejection of a motion by one of the members of the convention to begin the proceedings each day with prayer. Benjamin Franklin later responded that prayers were thought to be unnecessary. It is not surprising, therefore, that President John Adams approved a treaty passed by the U.S. Senate, which reads the following, quote, The government of the United States is not in any sense, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion, unquote. The United States Constitution established the world's first 
purely secular nation in which religion would have absolutely no influence upon the state. The First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which supposedly protects the religious liberty of individuals, was actually written to protect the state from any religious influence. The Constitution, therefore, is literally a godless document. God's not mentioned. It is also a Christless document, which allows the secular state to become an unrivaled authority that pronounces verdicts on every matter without looking into any higher power's position. Every human government, without exception, every human government before ours always turned towards a higher spiritual being. It might be a false god, but they at least appealed to a god. They accepted the influence of the priestly class and religion in public life. They acknowledged that the source of liberty came from above, not from the people, not from the state. But with the birth of our nation, one saw a new age, a new beginning, a new start from zero, a new world order where the city of man replaced Christendom and the heavenly city mentioned by St. Augustine. But knowing that man is a spiritual being, it was important that the revolutionary forces and newly established government provide an object of worship for the masses. What could they worship? No publicly sponsored statues of Christ the King exist in our nation. But we do have a statue of liberty in New York Harbor representing a goddess to be adored, along with icons of her various apostles in our nation's capital. If the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost would not be accepted, then liberty herself would have to be deified and believed in with a revolutionary faith. The Capitol building would become a temple of liberty, the founders told us where men would now bow before the altar of freedom. Various prayers and hymns were written in honor of this goddess, beseeching liberty that she would dwell amongst men in this land, and that, quote, the gates of hell would not prevail against her, unquote. Liberty trees and liberty poles began to be planted and erected as a sacramental sign of freedom's presence and woe to those who would commit the sacrilege of harming this sacred totem pole. We are a country that rejoices in the freedom we have, but many of us have no concept of the true meaning of freedom. So many men have fought and died for the cause of what we call liberty, from Lexington to Concord, to Antietam to Gettysburg, from Iwo Jima to Normandy, from Korea and Vietnam, and even to points as far wide as Afghanistan and Iraq, all for the cause of the empire of liberty. If there's one thing you remember from this sermon is this, freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do, but rather freedom is the power, the capacity to do what we ought to do. True liberty is being able to do the good and to avoid the evil. It is our free will choosing to pursue what is most reasonable and according to God's will and his laws. You see, the Holy Catholic Church is the only true defender of freedom in the world. The Holy Roman Catholic Church has always defended the gift of human freedom. When the ancient pagans pronounced the idea of fate and promoted this idea of fate and that men could not change their destiny, the church claimed that men could truly participate in writing their own history. Furthermore, when Protestant revolutionaries like Martin Luther denied that men had free will and were either predestined to heaven or hell by an arbitrary judge, the church defended the gift a free choice of the will. And in this modern world that promotes a false notion of freedom, which is nothing more than foolish license, 
doing whatever you feel like doing. The church promotes the notion of true liberty and doing what we ought to do according to the laws of God, the natural law that he made, and just and good human laws written by legislators. The Catholic Church teaches that liberty is the highest gift given to our human nature, naturally speaking. But the fact that we are in charge of our actions, unlike the beasts, is not enough. For this great gift of freedom can not only lead to good actions, but this same freedom can also lead to the greatest of evils. In other words, a saint can freely do some great things in life, but a wicked man can freely do some really horrible things as well. Therefore, the church teaches that true freedom must be reasonable and based on morality. Now, as most of you know, Woodstock was a musical festival. And much of the music presented on stage spoke of a false notion of freedom. In fact, the themes of all modern rock and pop music speak of rebellion, disdain for authority, and various breakings of the Ten Commandments. How different was the musical selection at Woodstock from some of the songs of our country's past. Take, for example, two famous hymns, namely America and America the Beautiful. Listen to some of these lyrics that describe the proper notion of freedom. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. But then the source and the protector of true freedom is mentioned. Our fathers, God to thee, author of liberty. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. Another example is taken from the second hymn, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. If we're going to do the right thing, the proper thing, the reasonable and godly thing, Our liberty needs the light of the law and the help of God's grace. And the more we are given the light of God's law, as well as his grace to keep the law, the more perfect our liberty will be. There are many today in this world that promote a very evil notion of liberty that is simply license or doing whatever one wants to do or feels like doing. Like Lucifer of old, these people do not attend to the law of God, but become a law unto themselves. I determine my own morality. I determine what is right and wrong. Do what thou wilt is the whole extent of the law. And by not obeying the authority of God and his law, they are not free, not free to do the good, but they rather are slaves to sin and the doing of evil. More unfortunately, however, is that some of these individuals gain power within society and they begin to break down morality and true freedom by introducing evil and unjust laws all with constitutional approval. A constitution without God being mentioned or Christ the King being mentioned necessarily leads to the abandonment of godly laws against adultery, which was present at the very beginning of this nation. Divorce, legalized divorce present there at the very beginning of the nation. Contraception, abortion, sodomy, obscenity, blasphemy, libel, slander, prostitution, usury, commerce on the Lord's day, profanity, idolatry, and much heresy in every corner and other horrors against the divine and natural law. And yet all these grave offenses against Almighty God find constitutional protection. But since the state and various governmental leaders have rejected the notion of God and His laws, they cannot call upon others to obey them based upon divine authority. And so they have to enforce these laws, these unjust laws, by oppressive and even violent means. Arrest those pro-life protesters. 
They're limiting a woman's right to kill her unborn child. When Almighty God, the author of human liberty and his laws in any way are rejected, tyranny must take over. If you would like to learn more about the church's teaching on true freedom, because she's the only protector of liberty in the world, I would suggest that you look up Pope Leo XIII on the internet and type in that great encyclical of his known as Libertas, which is obviously on the topic of liberty. We can all turn to Christ and his vicar, his representative on earth, to be further enlightened with the truth about freedom. In his encyclical letter, Libertas, Pope Leo XIII wrote about certain freedoms that we may not rightly understand, infected as many of us are by enlightenment thinking. The so-called freedom of worship, for example, must be properly understood. It's not a freedom from worship or a freedom from religion. Every state, like every individual, is bound to worship the one true God and his Christ, the king of the universe, and must obey and respect his authority. Justice and reason, therefore, forbid the state to be godless. In our dear country, our military services now allow Wicca, which is a form of witchcraft, to be officially recognized as a religion within the army, navy, marine corps, and Air Force, complete with Wiccan chaplains, all with constitutional approval. This is an offense against Almighty God, and it is abuse of a gift of freedom that he gave us, which again is the power to do the right thing, including worshiping the one true God. Pope Leo also discussed the issue of liberty of speech and liberty of the press, as well as liberty of teaching. Men have the right to freely state the truth in speech, newspapers, on television, and in the classroom, but lying opinions, deliberate falsehoods, and evil things have no rights and are to be censored. Censorship. Is freedom truly served, for example, when people have easy access to impure images Pornography should not be protected by the First Amendment, but rather repressed or limited and mitigated as much as possible. Because we should be concerned about souls as well as bodies. It is interesting that after the Civil War, you may not know this part of our history, after the Civil War, a group of Protestant clergy formed a group known as the National Reform Association. And it proposed that the preamble to the Constitution, we the people, be amended, changed, as it was greatly flawed, and was, quote, they called it, the original sin of the nation. That it caused so much moral corruption and violence connected with chattel slavery, enslaving men, and the bloody civil war that followed. The proposed amendment read in the following way. It's extraordinary. Quote, We the people of the United States, humbly acknowledging Almighty God as the source of all authority and the power in civil government, the Lord Jesus Christ as the ruler among the nations, His revealed will as the supreme law of the land in order to form a more perfect union, etc., Acknowledging God as the source of all authority. That was the amendment. And Jesus Christ as the reigning ruler of all nations. The House of Representatives reviewed the proposed change from this Protestant group and ruled against it. Quote, The fathers of the Republic in the convention which framed the Constitution decided that this country was to be the home of the oppressed of all nations on the earth, whether Christian or pagan. And in full realization of the dangers which union between church and state 
had imposed on so many nations of the old world decided with great unanimity that it was inexpedient to put anything in the constitution or frame of government which might be construed to be a reference to any religious creed or doctrine. It's a godless document, a Christless document. In closing, the Constitution provides no hope, no hope for remedying the problem of godly liberty become license. Many may want to work for a new constitutional convention that would correct what was called the original sin of the nation, not recognizing God and Christ the King. But in the meantime, a more practical step can be taken. It is up to Catholics to live a life of true Christian liberty where we reign in those passions that would enslave us living the life of the risen Christ further and further detaching from sin. And furthermore, our forsaking of material riches and passing delights will help us live a truly carefree and fearless life, enjoying true liberty as adopted sons of God the Father in Christ. Building a Catholic culture is the only hope for freedom. Building a Catholic culture in our homes, our parishes, our neighborhoods, where Christ reigns as King and He has no rival. That is the first step in bringing true liberty to this land. And eventually, we hope, His universal reign over all earthly rulers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.